Okay, so you guys seem to really like the last video I did on Blind Guardian, so might as well just keep this you know, as a little series, just keep on going with it. But like I mentioned in that last video, I want to do bands I'm also more immediately familiar with, not bands that I know next to nothing about. And I can't think of a better band to start with than with King Crimson. This is one of my all-time favorite bands, and they're easily my favorite progressive rock band. Like, anyone who's seen my channel knows that I love this band. I love this band so much that even though I have all their stuff digitally, like all their albums digitally, I still burned them onto CDs so I can play them on my CD player. And nobody uses CDs anymore. Yeah, guys, no joke, I have like six full sacks of CDs back here. It's on my little shelf. You guys can't see them, but I swear, it's all right there. I wonder if I should do a video talking about all the CDs I have. Let's put a pin in that one for later. Point is, this is a band that I very much love. I've listened to all 13 of their albums like numerous times, so expect this to be more of a quote-unquote review of each album. But with, that all the, with all that out of the way, let's just dive into it. The band's debut album released back in 1969, so over 50 years ago at this point. This album's also the first in what I refer to as the Peter Sinfield era of this band, the with a lineup comprising of Robert Fripp, Greg Lake, Michael Giles, Ian McDonald, and Peter Sinfield. So, now's the stack up. It's Court of the Crimson King. This album's a classic. Alright, so I have a small problem here. What do I say about this album that just hasn't been said about it already? One of the greatest debut albums of all time. One of the greatest progressive rock albums of all time. Arguably the album that set the progressive rock movement in motion. So what can I say about it that just hasn't been said before? Moonchild did not need to be as long as it is. Okay, so this may not necessarily be like, you no, know, a hot take, but yeah, as cool as Moonchild is with those with the fucking around the sound effects at the end, or like the soundscapes, it did not need to go on for nearly as long as it does. After a while, it just becomes a chore. Another thing about this album, and bear with me on this one, this album may not be exactly what you think it is. If there's one song that most people know by King Crimson, it's the opening track to this album, 21st Century Skits with Man. Now don't get me wrong, that song fucking rules. It's one of the best opening tracks ever, and it's just one of their best songs, period. However, if you go into this album thinking that every song on here will be like Skitswood Man, you are going to be disappointed. The rest of this album is actually surprisingly very mellow and very laid back. Like, Skitswood Man is the only song with any drive, any aggression on it. And if you like that sound of the band, you are not going to get any more of that on this record. That's not to say that the album itself is bad. Like, like I said, this album is great. You know, I Talk to the Wind, Epitaph is one of the best songs I've ever written. Uh, the parts of Moonchild that actually have a song is good. And the title track is just one of the best closing, closing tracks ever. Like I said, though, if you expect this album to be like 21st Century Schizoid Man, you're not going to get it here. On top of that, as good as this album is, like, this album is really good. Like, I'm going, this is an easy recommendation for this band. As good as this album is, I feel like they would do better on later albums. Fantastic Record, perfect place to start with this band. But I feel like the best from this band comes after this album. The band's first release of the 70s. This album also is the first to set a precedent for the lineups. In the sense that Robert Fripp will be the only consistent member going forward. Like, we still have Giles, we still have Lake, we still have Sinfield. The only difference is Sinfield is the only other credited member of King Crimson on here. Lake and Giles were done before this album came out. This album also features two future members of the band, Mel Collins and Gordon Haskell. And keep those names in mind because we are going to see them again later on. Now, about the album itself. Okay, so this album gets a reputation of it being just in the Court of the Crimson King Part 2. And while I maintain that there are differences, I think that comparison is kind of fair. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are some fantastic stuff on here. For starters, I always loved the Peace tracks, beginning, theme, and end. I always thought they were really well, well written. Pictures of a City is on this album. It's Pictures of a City. That's on friggin' rocks. 
Kaden, Kaden's in Cascade, that's the only song with Gordon Haskell on vocals, and it's such a nice, really pretty tune. I've pretty tune, I've always loved it. The title track is freaking gorgeous with the Mellotron used on it. I'm just gonna say it. I'm that weird guy who likes the track Cat Food. What? It's a fun track. It's silly, but I've always enjoyed it. I will say this though, it definitely feels more like an ELP track than a Crimson track. Like this feels like something that could come out with Tarkus. Regardless of all that, um, yeah, this album very much feels like them trying to recreate Court of the Crimson King. Like, a lot of the songs on this album, despite how good they are, it feels like it's just, no, this album's version of that track. Pictures of a City feels like this album's version of 21st Century Schizoid Man. Cadence and Cascade feels like this album's version of I Talk to the Wind. The title track feels like this album's version of Epitaph. You sensing a pattern here? On top of that, I'm just gonna say it. I don't like Devil's Triangle. I wouldn't go as far as to say it's this album's version of Moonchild, because I think this song actually is better than Moonchild. But like with Moonchild, this song goes on for far too long, and it just becomes boring after a while. In spite of all of that, no, despite it not being as good as in The Court of Crimson King, In the Wake of Poseidon is still, is still a really good album. I'd still recommend checking it out. Band's second album of 1970. Lineup includes No Frib, Sinfield, we officially have Collins and Haskell as part of the band this time, as well as newcomer Andy McCulloch on percussion with his first and only album with the band. This album is kind of interesting. Frib has gone on record to say that he considers this album unlistenable, and yeah, I don't agree with that at all. This album is very much a listenable experience. Now, is it good? Yeah, I'd say so. Circus is a pretty good track. No, I've always dug it. Indoor Games is a nice little come down from it. It's pretty cool. Fun fact about Indoor Games, that laughter we hear from Haskell at the end was because he thought that the song was terrible and he was just talking about how bad he thought it was. I guess Fripp and the others just liked the way it sounded so they just kept it on the track. This album's also the only album in their catalog to have a 20 minute epic, you know, with the title track. Unlike songs like Moonchild and Double Strangle though, I feel like this album is the best of those. I mean, it definitely kept my attention for far longer than those other two. That being said, I kind of get where Fripp is coming with this. There's a lot more of a jazz avant-garde feel to this album, and there's that time where you just kind of like, not necessarily scratch your head at the decisions they make, but they throw you for a loop of, for a minute. And on top of that, compared to the first two albums, yeah, this album is kind of weak. Honestly, out of the four albums from the Peter Simfield era, this might be my least favorite, or at least it's the one that I go back to the least. Not a bad album, definitely has its moments, but the band did better before this, and they're definitely going to do better after this. Alright, so now we are on the last album of the Peter Sinfield era. Like with the previous albums, we have a new rhythm section, this time with um, Boz Burwell and Ian Wallace surrounded the lineup, and the result we got was Islands. Controversial opinion time, I think this album is better than Lizard. Of the original albums, this is easily the most mellow and laid-back we've ever gotten from this band. Even songs like Sailor's Tale, which actually has some distortion to it, is still more on the slow side. 21st Century Schizoid Man, this song is not. For the longest time, I used to think this album was one of the most boring albums they'd ever made. But then the more and more I listened to it, just the more and more I grew to love and appreciate this album. Guys, this album is Gorgeous sounding. Foreman Tour Lady, Ladies of the Road, the title track, that's like, oh my god, the title track is so good. I get why people consider this the weakest album with the Peter Sinfield era, but I'm sorry, I can't agree with that. This is probably my favorite, second favorite of the Sinfield era. Is this the best thing the band would ever make? No. But it's easily the most underrated album in their catalog. Definitely check it out after you check out some of the other albums. Now, like I mentioned earlier, this was the last album of the Peter Sinfield era. Sinfield would later leave. And that's what leads us to quite possibly my favorite lineup of King Crimson. Okay. Now we're getting to the good stuff. Here's 1973, and Fripp has come back with an entirely new lineup this time. This time comprising of John Wetton, Jimmy Muir, David Cross, and God himself, Bill Bruford. The result was Larks, Tons, and Aspic, and yeah, guys, this is a good one. This, this, this is a really good one. 
King Crimson 1 completely experimental on this one, and I love it. Only six tracks, but my god, those six tracks. <laughs> Book of Saturday, Exiles, Easy Money, The Talking Drum, the... so good, so good. But if there are two songs on this album that I need to talk about, it's the two-part title track that opens the album and closes the album. Yeah, th these, these two songs are perfection, guys. Oh my god. I love these two songs so much, I covered them on my channel. To varying degrees of quality, I might add, but that's besides the point. Everyone is just playing their hearts out here, and you can just hear so much love and passion put into this album. And... I... I, I'm, I, I don't really know what else I can say about this album. It's just so good. Okay, any negatives I can think of? This album might have Wetton's weakest vocal performance. Okay, before I say anything else, Wetton does an amazing job here. Of course he does. It's John fucking Wetton. But when you compare it to the, to the later albums, to the next two albums with Wetton on them, yeah, I guess this would be his weakest vocal performance. Again, fantastic job. But he would do better on later albums, I feel like. Now, his bass plan on this album, yeah, no, that's perfect. So yeah, if you guys couldn't tell, um, I absolutely adore this album. It's one of my favorite records from this band. This is easily the best thing they made since In the Court of the Crimson King. Easy recommendation. So, how do you follow an amazing album like Lark's Tongues and Aspic? You follow it up with another amazing album. So the second album in what I refer to as the John Wetton lineup, is now unfortunately short a member. Jimmy Muir would unfortunately leave the band shortly after Larks were released. So the lineup is now comprised of Fripp, Wetton, Bruford, and Cross. 1974 saw the release of Starless and Bible Black. How do you describe this album? Okay, you know how Alive by Kiss is often regarded as one of the best live albums ever made, despite it not being completely performed live? Starless and Bible Black is one of the best studio albums made, that wasn't completely recorded in a studio. Eight tracks on this album, and only the first two songs were recorded in a studio, Great Deceiver and Moment. The remaining six songs were actually recorded live on stage, with the audience later edited out. The band decided to do this in order to try to capture the intensity they felt was lacking off Lark's Sons and Aspic. And... Yeah... Holy shit, guys. <laughs> the fact that most of these songs were recorded live on stage it feels like it's too good to be true, but they somehow managed it. The Night Watch, The Minster, The Title Track, Trio, it, oh, oh my god, guys, like, they record these on stage. Most of these songs were improvisations on stage. There was like no forethought ahead of time put into these songs, but these feel like fully completed songs. If there's one song that I need to talk about on this album, it has to be the closing track, Fracture. This song is pretty infamous in King Crimson's catalog. It's infamous in the sense that this is like one of the most impossible guitar parts ever written. Like I've seen covers of people on YouTube just trying to like play the song. And while they do a fantastic job, yeah, this song is... Fripp is the only person who can pull this song off perfectly. If I did have any criticism with this album, it's the fact that there aren't as, as many memorable songs on here. I know I listed off a whole bunch of really good songs, but honestly, the only songs I truly remember are Great Deceiver, Lament, Trio, and The Fracture. The other tracks, they're fine, they're fantastic, but at, with me personally at least, they don't stick with me as well. Regardless, another fantastic album from this run of the band, and it only gets better from here, guys. Alright, we are now at the last album of the John Wetton era. This album was recorded when the band was actually a trio, with just Bruford, Fripp, and Wetton in the band. Cross had left at some point, but he'd still made contributions to the album, particularly with track 4, Providence. And we actually saw the return of Mel Collins and Ian McDonald providing saxophones for some of the tracks as well. The result was Red, and... Okay, I can't think of any other way to say this, so I'm just going to say it. This is my favorite King Crimson album. Everything I love about this band is present here. The performances, the songwriting, the intensity, 
This is easily the most intense album this band would ever make. The title track, one of my favorite instrumentals of all time. Fallen Angel, this is easily one of the most underrated deep cuts in their catalog. One More Red Nightmare, god damn. Starless. It's starless. If there's one song you need to hear from this album, make it starless. This is easily the best song this band has ever written, in my opinion, at least. I'm legitimately having trouble trying to think of negative things to say about this album. That's how much I love this thing. So yeah, um, sounds obvious, but easy recommendation for me. Best album they ever made. Check it out if you haven't already. One last thing I'll say before we go into the next section, um, for the longest time, this was it from the band. Two weeks before the album came out, the band broke up. So for the longest time, this was the last King Crimson album. At least until... Okay. Some context for this next album. After the band broke up, the members went on to do their own thing. Bruford went to become the touring drummer for Genesis, Wetton went on to form a myriad of different bands, one of which would later become Asia, and Fripp just kind of did his own thing. He worked with a lot of different artists, including Brian Eno and David Bowie, but towards the end of the 70s and beginning of the 80s, he decided he wanted to form another band. Only this time, he wanted to push himself as a musician and try new things. He brought back Bruford, and he actually did something he never did before he hired another guitar player. The guitarist in question was Adrian Bildu, who would work, who had worked with the Talking Heads at that point in time. To round up the lineup, he brought on Tony Levin for bass and Chapman Stick, which if you don't know what a Chapman Stick is, stop this video, look it up, thank me later. This new band would be known as Discipline, and they started writing new music, they started performing, but after a while they decided, you know what, this gives us a lot of King Crimson vibes, let's just call this the new incarnation of King Crimson. The result of that was Discipline the Album. So, why am I bringing this up? Because this album is something else. Let me put it like this. If you go from Red immediately into Discipline, you, this will put you into shock. This album sounds nothing like anything the band had done up to this point. Gone are the heavily distorted guitars, gone are the weird experimental rhythms, gone are is the raw production. This album, clean guitars, clean production, a lot more emphasis on the vocals. This is King Crimson doing New Wave. Easily one of the biggest left turns in music as far as I'm concerned. And this might be one of the best goddamn things this band would ever make. <laughs> See, the reason why I think this album works so well is because even though they made such a massive genre shift, a mass massive change in sound, this still feels like King Crimson to me. Only seven tracks, and like with Red, almost all of these songs are just near perfection. Elfman Talk, one of the best opening songs I think I've ever heard, and I'm half convinced this is the reason why Jerry Was a Risk Red Driver exists. Frame by frame, no, the way the guitars fall out of sync with each other, but still sounds cohesive, it's just so... Mwah. Indiscipline with its weird polyrhythms and Baloo's frantic, insane performance in that song. I repeat myself when I'm distressed, 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 I repeat... Myself when I'm distressed, I repeat Dale Ahunjinjit is just... that's just a catchy song. The way Fripp is playing in 7-8 while everyone else is playing in 4-4, Gives it a very unnatural feel to it. And of course, Baloo absolutely nails the vocals here. The title track, the best way to end the album, in my opinion. Yeah, this album is very different from the rest of their catalog, but it's easily one of the best things they ever made. It's rare for a band to have two perfect albums in a row, let alone three. It is nearly unheard of to have a perfect four album run. But yeah, guys, Check this album out, it's worth a listen. Guys, it happened. We have an album where the lineup on it is the same as the previous one. All joking aside, it's pretty awesome to see that the Discipline lineup stayed together after Discipline. 
In fact, we actually, we're actually going to see this lineup for like the next couple albums. With some minor changes, I'll get to that when I get there. So after Discipline was released and they went on tour, they decided to go back, they decided to go back into the studio and record the follow-up. And from what I've read, it was a bit of a nightmare. I think I'm safe in saying that this is Baloo's Lizard. In the sense that he thought that this was the worst experience he ever made ever making an album. That being said, beat is pretty good. I dig it. I wouldn't say it's as good as Discipline, but you know, considering all the stuff going on behind the scenes, it could have been a hell of a lot worse. And you know, there are some really good tracks on here. Neil and Jack and Me is a great opening track. Heartbeat is probably the most mainstream song I've ever gotten from this band. This song, this is a song that would have been played on the radio back in the day. God, I can never pronounce this name. Uh... Track three, it's a good instrumental track. Neurotica is on here and Neurotica is the best song on this album. And Requiem is a pretty decent closing track. So yeah, like I said, good album. Not in my top five. Not this barely makes my top ten, but if only because they only have thirteen albums, and I can think of three albums that wouldn't make my top ten. But all in all, decent record. If you like discipline, you'll like this one fine enough. Final album of the discipline era, released in nineteen eighty four. Um, this might be a pretty short section. I honestly don't really know what else I can say about this album that I haven't already said about discipline or beat. If you like Discipline, you'll like this album fine enough. I will say this though, I think I like this album more than Beat, mostly because there's just more songs in here to go back to more. The title track, Model Man, Sleepless, which by the way, Sleepless is a better radio song than Heartbeat. Dig Me, Industry. Funnily enough, we also get part three in Lark's Clinton Aspic, which, you know, that already makes it better in my opinion. Yeah, not really sure what else I can really say about this album. If you like Discipline, if you like Beat, you get more of it here. Unfortunately, the statement that nothing good can last is unfortunately true here. After the tour of this album finished up, Fripp went again dissolved King Crimson. And it would be another 10 years before we saw anything from this band. And the album we got next is a pretty unique one. The year is 1995 and King Crimson has come back with a new lineup. Sort of. Fripp, Baloo, Bruford, and Levin from the Discipline era all come back for this lineup. In addition to two new musicians, Pat Masolato and Trey Gunn, this lineup is what people often refer to as the double trio, with two guitarists, two bass players slash chapman stick players, and two drum set players. The band went on tour, they recorded an EP called Vroom in 1994, and in 1995 they put out Thrak. This one? Yep, yeah, it's pretty good. I like it. For people who wanted a return to the more Lark songs and aspect sound that the Discipline era was really missing, we more or less get it back here. In addition to the more streamlined songwriting from the Discipline era, there's a lot of really cool tracks on here. I've always loved the Vroom tracks, you know, the ones just called Vroom and then Vroom Vroom and then Vroom Vroom Coda. Dinosaur's a good track, I enjoyed that one a lot. Walk Around Here is a nice airy one. One time, it's a pretty cool one. I also really enjoyed that one. Outside of that, though, there's not really much I can really say about this album. I don't know why, but this album for me, like, as good as it is, it always just felt like it was just kind of there. Not amazing, not awful, just, you know, kind of there. I will say this, though. If there's one thing that I do find kind of disappointing with this album, album it's this. The idea with the double trio is like when they went to a studio to record this album, they had each trio in one ear. As cool of an idea that is, I wish they did more with it. I'm gonna be honest, I didn't find out about that until I did more research, research on this album. And yeah, I honestly couldn't tell at first. Hell, even going back, I can barely tell that there's two different trios going on in each year. Despite the shortcomings, Thrax is a pretty cool album. You'll like it if you're more into like the John Wetton era of the band. Primus was right. They can't all be zingers. After Thrax was released, Crimson lost two members. The first member was Tony Levin. Which, okay, yeah, that sucks. But no, Trey Gunn is no a formidable musician in his own right. He can hold his own against Levin. The other musician was Bill Bruford. You know, 
the guy who's considered the drummer for King Crimson. Guys, the last album Crimson put out before Bruford joined was Lizard back in 1971. That's not to say Pat is a bad drummer. I saw this band live. This Pat is an amazing performer. But when you're comparing a good drummer like Pat to God himself, Bill, I don't, I'm sorry, but I don't care how good you are, you're not going to beat Bill Bruford. Despite that, the band soldiered on, and in 2000, they released The Construction of Light, and this album is a bit of a mess, guys. I'm sorry. The funny thing is, I wouldn't even really go as far as to call this album bad, though. Like, for all intents and purposes, this is a good album. And there are some pretty good tracks on here. The more I listen to Prozac Blues, the more it grows on me. We get Fractured, and that's easily the best song on the record. We also get the fourth part to Lark's Tongues and Aspic, and it's the only part that actually has vocals to it. So yeah, there are good moments on this album. The not-so-good parts... Oof. Guys, this is some weird shit, even by Crimson's already weird standards. There's just a lot on this album that just does not work, I'm sorry. The production, I don't think is very good. I do not like the sound that got out of Pat's drums on here. But none of those are my big issue with this album. Remember back when I was talking about Dark Songs and Aspic, one of the things I loved about it was just how much love and passion was put into it? This album feels soulless. It feels mechanical. It feels artificial. And I hate saying that because this is King Crimson. This is a band that can make you feel a myriad of emotions. Like I said though, not a bad album per se. But out of every single thing that King Crimson has done, this is easily the worst thing they've made. If you're going to listen to this album, listen to every other Crimson album first. Because every other Crimson album is better than The Construction of Light. Okay, so I don't know if it's because this is the record that immediately follows Construction of Light, or if it's because it's just a genuinely great album. But god damn do I love the power to believe. Every issue I had with the previous album is gone here. There is just so much passion put in this song. It, it almost feels like an apology for Construction of Light, honestly. The first real song on this album is Level 5. Do I need to say anything else? It's Level 5. But in fact, Rip actually considers Level 5 the fifth part, when I put four fingers, the fifth part in the Lark Songs and Aspect Suite. Going as far as to, you know, sometimes whenever they perform the song live, they would refer to it as Lark's Part 5, which, you know, that's pretty cool, I guess. All the other tracks on this album, though, are also just so good. Eyes Wide Open, Electric, Facts of Life, Dangerous Curves, Happy With What You Have To Be Happy With. So good. I know some people have issues with the Power To Believe tracks, particularly with Baloo's use of autotune on them. I get it. I can't say I agree with it. I feel like it adds a lot to the tracks. Baloo's not using the autotune because he can't sing, he's just using it because he thinks it sounds cool. Yeah, guys, this is easily the best album this band has made since Discipline. I wouldn't say make this one the first listens you make, though. Definitely check out some of the other records, then check this one out. This is a record that definitely benefits from knowing the band's previous catalog. So yeah, obviously, it's obvious. I absolutely love Power to Believe. Definitely give it a listen. Do I like King Crimson? Do I like King Crimson? Done all right, I guess. Oh, and for the people who are upset in my discipline section for saying that that album's not as rhythmically complex as the other albums, you will be happy to know that I am a fucking idiot for saying that. Yeah, I don't know why I said that, but now having actually gone through, you know, this book and looking at all the stuff they're doing, yeah, I don't know why I had said that. This might not make as much sense to my non-musician viewers, but yeah, to those who know how to read music, um... So we have guitars in 5-8, but they're doing different phrasings of 5-8.
Then the Chapman stick comes in in 1716 underneath that while that 5 8 is going on. At the same time, the drums are doing 1716 in the hands and 4 4 in the feet. Yeah, Andrew, that's totally not rhythmically complex. You, you sure do know your music. I'm getting a bit off track here, aren't I? So, yeah, if you guys couldn't tell, I absolutely love this band. I mean, I kind of have to love this band in order to talk about them for how long is this video now? Jesus Christ, this is pretty long. I should probably wrap this up pretty quickly. If you guys want to get into King Crimson, then yeah, start with Poor the Crimson King. Even if you don't like this album, just listen to it just so you can finally say that you have listened to it. After that, um, Lark Songs and Aspic, Starless and Bible Black, Red, and Discipline. Can't go wrong with any of those albums. A little sad that we might not get anything else from this band considering that this was their last tour of the US and that their tour of Japan might be the last one they ever do before they retire for good. But this band has released some incredible music and it's they've definitely changed the way I listen to music and how I write music as well. So if this video doesn't do anything else, I hope it at least encourages you to listen to this band. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. You know, now that I have a six stream bass, I can actually cover Elephant Talk. Oh my god, I can actually cover level five!